Welcome to Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. On this podcast, we'll be discussing nonviolent readings of Latter-day Saint scripture. I'm Dan, and I'm joined by my wife and co-host, Marianne. The Latter-day Peace Studies Project is born out of a desire to proclaim peace by providing an opportunity to approach religion, scripture, and relationships with God in a peaceful way. As we develop peace within ourselves first, we can reflect peace into the world around us. The Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me podcast seeks to assist listeners in their approach to scripture by providing nonviolent interpretation. Our hope is that we can integrate the teachings of the scriptures into our efforts to find peace within ourselves and proclaim peace in the world. Welcome back to Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me. This week we're in Alma chapters 13 through 16. Was this the first place that Ben and Shiloh started recording? No, they started back in Mosiah 29. In Mosiah 20, okay. Mm -hmm. So our episode 200 lined up with their episode 1. That's right. But this was the first episode that I remember listening to Shiloh and Ben talk about because obviously this, we have the tragedy at Ammonihah, which is I think one of the more impactful events in the Book of Mormon that we're going to discuss. I also wanted to to take some time because we have this book that examines Alma chapters 12 and 13, which has some wonderful essays, and I quoted a little bit from it last time, but we wanted to set up some of the framework for today and discussion with, uh, with some quotations from that book. Marianne? Yeah, so some of these ideas I want to talk about to open us are from an essay called The Heart in Alma 12 and 13 by Robert A. Reese. And he talks about the heart as the locus of the mind and the soul in Hebrew thought. You thought with your heart. And there are 16 references to the heart just in Alma chapters 12 and 13. That's more than in any other two contiguous chapters in the Book of Mormon. So Alma in this sermon in Ammonihah is very concerned with the conditions of people's hearts, particularly having soft hearts as opposed to hard hearts. So he admonishes them for their hard heartedness and asks them to turn to the Lord and soften their hearts. He quotes Walter A. Elwell here, and I I just want to read this. The heart, in effect, is the whole person in all of his or her distinctive human activity as a thinking planning, willing, feeling, worshiping, and socially interacting being. So our our heart is all of us, the essence of who we are. And within the context of these chapters, Alma 12 and 13, having a hard heart is to deliberately resist the whisperings and entreatings of the spirit, to willfully ignore and reject the messages of angels and prophets, to be proud and unteachable, to shut down the tender feelings of the heart, to spurn the gift of mercy offered through Jesus Christ, and to attempt to persuade others to harden their hearts. He also says that the intelligence of the heart is a special kind of imaginative intelligence, which combines knowing and loving in a single function. And so if you think about starting way back in the early parts of Mosiah, when King Benjamin is giving his speech, and he asks them to remember a lot, and then Alma, when he gives his speech to the people of Zarahemla in Alma 5, and he asks them to remember a lot of these things, remembering is related to both knowing and having a receptive or softened heart. So when they're asking them to remember, if their minds are located in their hearts, as they would be for people related to a Hebrew way of thinking, to remember is to pass through the heart again. So re-feel those feelings. Allow yourself to remember what those things felt like when you were in captivity or when the Lord delivered you or those spiritual experiences that you have had. Feel those again and just the power that that has. Alma's plea with the people of Ammonihah to feel those feelings again. They are not that far removed from where some of them must have known more of the gospel or had some more experience with it. He's begging them to to open up their hearts and feel these things again. Just the reminder that remembering is as much an exercise of the heart as the mind. It involves our our feelings. I think it, I think it's proper to say that Alma is envisioning himself as trying to reach these people in the same way that Melchizedek reached his people and he's going to refer to Melchizedek and Melchizedek was the king of peace. And I don't think he's just saying the king of no war. 
I think he's talking about an active Zion-like society. And I think he recognizes that you've got to change your heart, right? That's what that's what his repentance is. It's changing your heart by allowing these things into it. Yeah. Alma chapter 13, verse 1, I think we lose a little bit by not immediately going back to Alma 12, the end of Alma 12, but because he says, and again, my brethren, right? So if you, if you don't have that context, but he does say, I would cite your minds forward to the time. Now here... Just as a little reminder, he's not asking them to conceive of some time in their future, but he's going going all the way back to Adam and Eve. And he's saying, now that we've gone back to Adam and Eve, you need to go forward in time to when the Lord God gave these commandments unto his children. Would that you should remember that the Lord God ordained priests after his holy order, which was after the order of his son to teach these things unto his people. So again, we're playing in this domain of time where he's having people cast their minds back so that they can imagine things that are to come in the future. And since they are in the future from that, they can look back and see it being fulfilled. And I think that that's one of the ways that he's asking them to develop faith. As he's saying, look back to the promises that the Lord already gave and fulfilled. And that's kind of, that's, I mean, in the purpose statement of the Book of Mormon, like the title page, to show into the room into the house of Israel what great things the Lord has done for their fathers. Go back in time to their fathers, see the promises, and then see the fulfillments that are in the Book of Mormon. In verse 2, we get, and those priests were ordained after the order of his son. And in verse 1, there's his holy order. Alma is really emphasizing the order. And he did that all the way starting back in Zarahemla. And he's talking about his priesthood authority, his authority to preach and teach. And it does seem to be, in this context, less connected to officiating in specific ordinances or sacrifices and more connected to his responsibility to teach the people the commandments. Yes, it may. Well, it may also remind you of one of that one of those things that we talked about all the way back in, you know, First Nephi, where Lehi is performing sacrifices outside of Jerusalem, and you kind of have to ask yourself, well, he's not a priest of the temple. Where is he getting these? Where is he getting his authority to do these things? What's the hypothesis that was put forward all the way back with you know a rock, a pillar of fire, uh, a rock? A dream, a that. rock, and a, a pillar dream, of fire. A dream, a rock, and a pillar of fire. One of the hypotheses that was put forward was this idea that actually Laman and Lamuel were pro-law. And so we have the contrast between the law and the visionary men. And the law, you get your authority from being you know, a member of this order. And so Alma's saying, well, no, no, no. I'm a member of the order of God. And actually... We come before the commandments. This was prepared from the foundation of the world. So it actually pre-exists the commandments, even the scriptures that you guys are studying. And I think Alma is doing this partially to say, yes, I'm not chief judge. I can't force you. I'm the chief priest. But where does my priesthood come from? And do we have any historical precedent for priests going and preaching to people who they don't have legal authority over. I think Alma's going to touch on some of those things. Verse 3, we get this called and prepared from the foundation of the world according to the foreknowledge of God on account of their exceeding faith and good works, in the first place being left to choose good or evil. Now, I think that you could write several essays on, is this an endorsement of the pre-existence? My gut says, maybe. <laughs> to quote Futurama, all I know is my gut says maybe. Because you both have... This idea of in the first place being left to choose good or evil. Okay, well, when's that first place? That seems to be pre existent to their life. But then it also says according to the foreknowledge of God. So maybe it's God understanding what they would do in mortality. Hard to say. That brings up lots of questions about agency. And I would just point people to <laughs> Blake Osler or Adam Miller, who have done a lot of writings and theory on these sorts of things. And I don't think that I can take a full position in the time that we have allotted here. <laughs> uh, and that, that time is just self, self-imposed, self right? But Alma is going to refer to people who have been called and prepared in lots of different times and lots of different stations. And at times it seems like he's going to refer to himself. He's going to refer to maybe Amulek. He's going to refer to Melchizedek. So I think he's more trying to give us this general pattern prepared from the foundation of the world, called, ordain, and then preach the commandments, teach the commandments. So verse six, thus being called by this holy calling, ordained to the high priesthood of the holy order of God to teach his commandments unto the children of men that they also might enter into his rest. And again, that's a phrase that was found a lot in the end of chapter 12. And I think he's showing what his ultimate goal is 
for Ammonihah. Why is he doing this? Because it's not just a question of, do you have the authority? But why are you even bothering? Because having the authority doesn't give you necessarily the reason. His reason is so that he can help bring them into the rest of God, which they have no conception over. Because they don't have any concept of resurrection and they don't have any concept of repentance. So how can you how can you have a rest from your labors if you don't believe that there's any labors to do and you don't believe that there's anything that happens after you die? Mm-hmm. Except that God's going to save you. Yeah. It, somehow. It removes all importance from what we do. So in verse 8, now they were ordained after this manner, being called with a holy calling and ordained with a holy ordinance and taking upon them the high priesthood of the holy order, which calling and ordinance and high priesthood is without beginning or end. Thus they become high priests forever after the order of the Son, the only begotten of the Father, who is without beginning of days or end of years, who is full of grace, equity, and truth. And thus it is. Amen. You had some thoughts on these verses. Well, I mean, just one thought really, which is, why did we break up the verses and chapters the way we did? This seems like it would be a much more natural ending to the chapter 12, because we did, we get an, and thus it is, amen, right? Which if there's ever an ending to, <laughs> to a chapter, you would think that that would be it. It makes me think that the verse before that, or the verse that it ends, that and thus it is amen is a benediction to saying the name of the son. It could his, be. His full like title, that that's what, and thus it is amen is sort of concluding. That's very possible that he is, he is recognizing this. You know, the, the other suggestion is that he just is taking a little break. We don't know how long this took. We know we, we also only get partial. They didn't write down everything they preached in Ammonihah. So. And verse 10 sort of starts how you would think that people would, Come back from a little break. Now, as I said concerning this whole order, I've got to remind you of what I've been talking about or this high priesthood. So, you know, we get a little bit more. He reemphasizes, you know, these people are they are not arbitrarily chosen. This is not just randomly chosen. It, it's choosing to repent and work righteousness rather than perish. Therefore, they're called after the holy order and were sanctified. I think that's something that we learn a little bit now. They're sanctified and their garments were washed white through the blood of the lamb. This seems to have maybe have some connection to sort of temple ideas, themes. Later on, will be there will be references to being washed white in the blood of the lamb, but it would actually be for the people themselves and not just the garments. But I think the imagery still makes sense. So... This is after being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, having their garments made white, being pure and spotless before God, could not look upon sin, save it were with abhorrence. And there were many, exceedingly great many, who were made pure and entered in the the rest of the Lord their God. So again, cast your minds back. Think about these people who have existed in history, who have done these things, and who died and entered into the rest of the Lord. Who might some of those people be? Well, what about the people in the days of Melchizedek? Well, Melchizedek was a high priest after this order. He had the high priesthood. This was Melchizedek. You guys should know him. He's the one Abraham paid tithes to. You've quoted the Old Testament to me. Well, here's a little bit of Old Testament lore to you. Another point that I think Alma might be making here is that one of the questions has been about his authority, right? He's not chief judge, so he has no technical authority over them, but he's still going to preach to them. Well, Melchizedek... As far as I can tell, wasn't Abraham's king? He had no technical legal authority over Abraham, but he was still the high priest, right, after this order. And so Abraham went and paid tithes to him. So a recognition of, yes, no legal authority, but authority. And actually, authority that's way better than legal authority, right? (laughs) In verse 16, now these ordinances were given after this manner, that thereby the people might look forward on the Son of God, it being a type of his order, or it being his order, and this, that they might look forward to him for remission of their sins, that they might enter into the rest of the Lord. So to me, that kind of, tell me if you think it's a stretch to think of those exercising the priesthood after the order of the Son are supposed to be types of Christ. They do what he would do. Their preaching and teaching is in his name so that when he comes, people will recognize him. People will know it for what it is. I think absolutely. And again, we've got Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem, king over the land of Salem. And his people were strong in iniquity abomination. They had all gone astray. They were full of all manner of wickedness. Well, I mean, if there's a better description for who Christ is, he's king over all the land. But 
even his faithful people are still full of wickedness, right? <laughs> we, we still mess up and sin. But yeah, I, I think that that's absolutely true because the ordinances were given after this manner. Well, what manner is being referenced? Well, it's the people in the days of Melchizedek, who was a high priest, who also took upon himself the high priesthood forever. So in what manner? The manner that Melchizedek did, the manner that Abraham recognized in Melchizedek. And so Melchizedek is a type of Christ, a type of his order. There's a reason that the full name of the, the priesthood was changed to the Melchizedek priesthood to avoid using the name too frequently. We learn a little bit more about Melchizedek things that we don't get in the Old Testament, but presumably we're in the brass plates. Melchizedek, exercising mighty faith, received the office of high priesthood according to the holy order of God to preach repentance unto his people. And behold, they did repent, and Melchizedek did establish peace in the land in his days. So this is another thing that I think represents Alma's aspirations here, because he was chief judge, not king, but chief judge, and his father was part of the legal and political and ecclesiastical authority. So just like Melchizedek reigned under his father, Alma reigned under his father. Do we? I don't think they were concurrent. I think yeah, Alma I, the I'm Elder tr- passed away first. Yeah, but he he was converted before, and he went about teaching. It's true. So he still was acting in the church under his father. But anyway, verse 20, I think, is fun, thanks to the little English, right? We get this, now I need not rehearse the matter. What I've said may suffice. Behold, the scriptures are before you. If you will rest to them, it shall be to your own destru- destruction. So if you don't enter into his rest, it's because you rested the scriptures, right? W-R-E-S-T. I always appreciate a good pun, even if uh, I don't think that that was intended by (laughs) either (laughs) Alma nor Joseph Smith, but I'm making it, so. In verse 21, Alma tells them, now is the time to repent for the day of salvation draweth nigh. And so this is, of course, what prophets are always called to do, right? Called to preach repentance. But I think it's especially pointed here because the Nehors don't believe in repentance, they don't think there's a need for it. And that is exactly what's creating all the problems in this city. And he's reminding them that it actually does matter what they do and that their actions have consequences. We are about to find out what some of those consequences may be as we move forward. But just, yeah, his his emphasis on repent today, like just, just do it now, <laughs> because that particular, I guess you could say, fallacy that it doesn't matter what you do and that you can that you don't need repentance is going to have catastrophic results for these people. Well, and I mean, it's going to be like around a year, less than a year, maybe it's slightly over a year. I don't I don't remember how the math works out, but when Ammonihah is going to be completely wiped out in one day. So actually this is pretty pressing. Yeah. Like Yes, you do need to repent because if you don't repent, you're going to stick around here. And if you stick around here, bad things are going to happen. Actually, bad things are going to happen to everybody who sticks around Ammonihah, righteous or not. This, I mean, this this sets up the, the tragedy of Ammonihah. And I think it also, I just, here's one thing that I don't understand is if they don't believe in the need for repentance, why do they care about Alma and Amulek preaching against the law. I mean, I know it's because they value, you know, the politics and their ability right. to play with words and those sorts of things. But what what are they claiming the consequences of that are going to be? Who's, yeah. What, what are they transgressing? It is elevating the arbitrary standards of the amoral government law. And I'm just saying amoral because it's it doesn't seem to be founded on any principles because right. they're about to commit mass murder and it's going to be totally fine. Apparently didn't go against the law, but they have an issue with Alma and Amulek coming and telling them how bad they are. So it's like, I, okay, why why am I looking for any sort of, you know, consistency among this group? Well, I'm not, but it's it's to point out again, one of the issues with the knee horse, right, is not that they're, not that they preach that God is going to save everyone, but that they preach that there are no consequences to your actions, right? We don't have to believe in repentance because you don't need to change, right? You don't have to change your mind about anything, what you believe is already right. And that might be one of the reasons that they really don't like Amulek 
because Amulek was one of them. And then he goes and changes his mind. And he says, no, 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 I've been, I didn't listen. There have been dozens of times that, that the God has been trying to speak to me. And I would bet that for a lot of the people of Ammonihah, they're like, oh, wait, <laughs> all of these times that I felt that thing, that's God trying to speak to me that changed, changed me. How much more do you revile like what you see? You know, it's that Jung quote, right? The thing that we hate in others is the thing that we hate in ourselves. It's that projecting. Yeah, absolutely. And then he, he ends with this desperate plea. I wish from the inmost part of my heart, yea, with great anxiety, even unto pain, that you would hearken unto my words and cast off your sins and not procrastinate the day of your repentance, but that you would humble yourselves before the Lord and call on his holy name. So one of those things that he said earlier that the angels teach men to do, right, is to call on the name of God. Call on his holy name and watch and pray continually that you may not be tempted above that which he can bear, and thus be led by the Holy Spirit, becoming humble, meek, submissive, patient, full of love, and all long suffering, which again harks back to Mosiah three nineteen. those lists of Christ-like qualities. Having faith on the Lord, having a hope that you shall receive eternal life, having the love of God always in your hearts, that you may be lifted up at the last day and enter into his rest. So we have those Christ-like characteristics and faith, hope, and love. And he's, you know, he's trying to, he's trying to leave them with some good, positive, don't be these things, but do be these things. Fill your lives with these good things. Yes. And I think, I wonder how much of that is, there were echoes of Abinadi's. So when, when Abinadi was giving his speech, there were a couple times when it seemed like he recognized he was going to die, that he knew what his mission was. And I wonder if Alma is being made aware of what's about to happen. And so this is his parting message, not to the Nehorites, but to the people who are truly repenting, that they can have faith on the Lord, that they can have hope to receive eternal life in spite of the awful tragedy that's about to occur. I mean, tra tragedy is probably not the right word, but I, I can't think of a, a better, like a, a more appropriate one. The awful wickedness that's about to occur. Many do believe on his words, begin to repent and search the scriptures. The more part of them, though, were desirous to destroy Alma and Amulek, where they were angry with Alma because of the plainness of his words unto Zeezrom. They're offended on Zeezrom's behalf, but Zeezrom's actually going to change. Mm -hmm. But they can't, they can't, have that. They also said that Amulek had lied unto them and had reviled against their law and also their lawyers and judges. First off, that's a lie. They didn't revile against the law, as they made clear. So they don't really have an issue with liars, right? It's calling out their wickedness that they have an issue with. Any upset to their order, their social order. They're angry with Alma and Amulek and they sought to put them away privily, which I would think would mean have them assassinated or kind of murdered in the night or taken out back or in secret. Privately, basically. Right, yeah. But instead, and we don't really get why that doesn't happen, but instead they bind them with strong cords and take them before the chief judge. So they decide to escalate this. And this is not the chief judge of Zarahemla, of the whole Nephite civilization. This appears to be a more regional chief judge that would be complicit in the all of the sins happening in Ammonihah. And he is also after the order and faith of Nehor. It says in verse 16. I'm sure if you've established the system of judges and payments as they have in Ammonihah, well, obviously you have to have multiple levels of judges. You got to have the regional de judges and the district judges and the assistant district judges. And yeah, it goes all, all the way all to the, the various top for levels and bureaucracy. But it does seem that this, that Ammonihah in general is sort of removed, right? It seems to be far from Zarahemla. And so they seem to have a little more regional autonomy, technically under the chief judge of Zarahemla, but they're kind of far out, you know, and they kind of do a lot of their own thing. So as long as they don't raise too many eyebrows outside of their immediate vicinity, they kind of get left alone. Verse 6, we get Zeezrom beginning to be astonished. He has this sort of Alma the Younger, harrowed up under the consciousness of his own guilt, encircled by the pains of hell. He admits his guilt and begins to plead for Alma and Amulek. And again, that seems a little bit like how Alma, Alma 1, pled for Abinadi. And even King Noah didn't want to kill Abinadi after everything, right? He had to be persuaded by his priests 
again. Zezrum is going to be cast out as well as the men. Well, all those who believed in the words which had been spoken by Alma and Amulek, but except for the wives and children. So they scapegoat some number of the believers, right? They cast them out. They drive them forth. They forcibly exodus them from Ammonihah, but the women and children stay. And I mean, we, we've talked a lot about scapegoating and bimetic violence and all of these sorts of things. There are many themes and conclusions to draw from all of these things, but the ultimate lesson, I think, is that there are beliefs that matter. Actually, your beliefs do matter. This is why Alma and Amulek came to preach. They didn't preach because, you know, they wanted to rack up numbers in the Church of Zarahemla. They didn't want to say, look how many people I baptized. They didn't want to go show how, like, clever they were. They didn't even just want to make everyone be like them. They came because, actually, the beliefs of Nihor, this belief in no repentance being needed, and Christ not coming, and universal salvation unconditionally, without people having to change, and we saw it with Nihor. Nihor slew Gideon. These beliefs lead to violence. They lead to murder. They bring the wives and children and cast them into the fire. They bring the records and cast them into the fire. There's a part that makes me wonder if, because they bring Alma and Amulek to this place of martyrdom, that they can see the, the destruction by fire of these people. There's a part of me that wonders if this is him saying, you've spoken to us about eternal fire and torment of the wicked, but look, look right here, here and now, because that's all that matters. We don't believe in any future thing. This is the pain and suffering that we're seeing now of those who claim to believe. Yeah, this part is always difficult for me to read because I don't have the algorithm by which God determines which innocence to save and which innocence blood must stand as a witness against the wicked. I don't know how he decides that. But I do know that this tragedy can't be laid at God's feet. This is, as you were saying, Dan, this is the end result. This is the fruit born of the order and faith of Nehor. Alma, Alma says, the spirit constraineth me that I must, must not stretch forth mine hand. He says, you know, the Lord suffers them that they may do this thing or that the people may do this thing unto them according to the hardness of their hearts. But that is such a, that is such a challenging thought. And maybe perhaps there is truth in this occasion. But I would caution against using this as a proof text when we have suffering and death to say this tragedy occurred because God wanted it to be this way. He's received them in your eternal glory, so don't worry. I think we, we need to recognize, you know, Alma and Amulek are truly conflicted here, and they're deeply, profoundly affected. And while we don't get a ton of their reflections on these things, the actual fallout from this event goes on throughout the rest of the Book of Mormon. And one of the ways that we know is because verse 14 we get the phrase lake and fire and brimstone. And we've seen that phrase before. It's been used by Jacob. It's been used by other prophets. This is the last time it's used. And I think I seem to remember that four years ago now, when Ben and Shiloh recorded on this, that they pointed out that this was the last time that fire and brimstone was used to describe you know, hell in the Book of Mormon. I can't remember if they were the ones who pointed it out or if I read it in another commentary or heard it in another podcast. But I, I think it's important to bring that up because this event, this event goes to show that actually the people who, who are actually physically experiencing, not metaphorically, experiencing fire and brimstone, they're not the wicked. The righteous are being made to suffer fire and brimstone right here, right now. It's perhaps given the ability to go back and look and see, perhaps we can make some sort of reason. I hesitate to say justification, but reason and understanding of why. Perhaps it is because these people so strongly believe in a disconnect between action and consequence to the point where they reject the idea of repentance, that God is allowing this, that that's what stays God hand, God's hands because they will have a consequence from this. And yes, it's separated by time, but everyone in Ammonihah is wiped out. Entirely. Again, I don't think that that's something that we can say like, oh, well, that's why God did it. I think that's something that we can say that perhaps we can look back and draw this lesson after after the fact. Mm -hmm. But in the moment, I, I can't imagine. As Alma and Amulek are witnessing this 
awful scene, this terrible violence, the chief judge of the land comes up to them and hits them. And I actually counted how many times he specifically hits Alma and Amulek in this chapter, and it is at least five times. And then others also add their hits, their violence to that. He is the one who says, After what ye have seen, will ye preach again unto this people that they shall be cast into a lake of fire and brimstone? And so after him spitting those vile words at Alma and Amulek in lieu of, or in light of what's happening, they never use that phrase, the lake of fire and brimstone again. That's, that is off the table, just as you said. They don't answer. Well, he hits them again and then, and asks them a question and they don't answer. And then he hits them a third time and delivers them to the officers to be cast into prison. And they're in prison for three days. And then more of their persecutors come to the prison to question them. I think that's a very mild term for what they do to abuse them and persecute them. They hit them again. Alma and Amulek suffer from hunger and thirst. They're in prison. They took their clothes from them so they were naked and they were bound with strong cords. And so the, actually all of these things that they're experiencing at this moment actually made me think of the inversion of Matthew twenty five forty that feeding those who are hungry, of giving water to those who thirst, of visiting those in prison, of clothing the naked, and they are causing this suffering, right? They're not just not alleviating suffering. They are heaping more suffering upon. Well, it's, it's also a type of Christ. He was stripped. He was smitten. He was jeered at. He was made to suffer things in silence that he could stop. He gave no answer. They gave no answer. So I, I think that, yeah... This is this is typological as well. Part of me wonders, when we get to verse 24, they've had days now where they're going back and checking on Alma and Amulek. And they're, they're running through this routine of smiting them and asking them questions. And part of me wondered if we're seeing a manifestation of a guilty conscience in here, that these people are trying to confirm with themselves. They're, they're going back because they have to see and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I know I have this awful shame of what I've just done. I've just been party to mass murder. But I mean, I mean, like, they're not being delivered. So God's not taking care of them. So apparently I'm on the right side. I'm correct. There's no consequences. They've got no power. We, in fact, were totally justified in everything we did. Because look, look at the results. Again, only being able to deal with the here and now. And verse 25, when they... They all went forth and smote them, saying the same words, even until the last. It reminded me of the story of the woman had taken in adultery. I think that even until the last, kind of, it's, it's when they exit and leave after being unable to accuse the woman taken in adultery, right? Well, here, they are perfectly willing to accuse. They are all willing to step up and do this thing. And instead of being stooped down, Alma and Amulek like, finally stand up, and Alma like, cries out. How long? Which I think is the cry of many of us right how long oh lord yeah you had you had some thoughts on 26 and 27 right yeah well that alma's prayer is oh lord give us strength according to our faith which is in christ even unto deliverance and then i i just connected it when in 28 when they come out of the prison for the lord had granted unto them power according to their faith which was in Christ. And so the, the strength and the power and according to their faith in Christ. Kind of reminds me of Nephi, him praying for the for the bursting of the bands all the way back, first Nephi. Verse 27, they fell to the earth. Again, Book of Mormon trope, falling to the earth. Then the chief judge and lawyers and priests and teachers who smote Alma and Amulek were all slain by the fall thereof. So those ones who were most guilty, I mean, you know, the leaders of the people were 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 killed. I mean, I mean, like, come forth out of the prison. I thought this was interesting because they were loosed from their bands and they were delivered from prison, right? And so they've been talking about the bands, the chains of hell, which are overcome by Christ, the, the loosing of the bands through resurrection, and then they're delivered from prison, which might be that second death. Here we're seeing a literal deliverance of Alma and Amulek like, according to what they've been preaching and teaching. Not in the future, but here and now. That's chapter 14. Chapter 15, Alma and Amulek are commanded to depart out of the city, presumably by the Spirit, and they go to the land of Sidom, or Sidom. They find the people who left the land of Ammonihah, who had been cast out in stone because they believed in the words of Alma, 
and they related unto them all that happened unto their wives and children and concerning themselves and of their power deliverance, right? So we've seen many reunions in the Book of Mormon, many people fleeing and then being brought back together. This is just one of those awful situations where you're not hearing from your family for days after being driven out, probably assuming the worst, and then having it confirmed. I can't imagine the reception that they got there. It can't have been a happy one. But mercifully, perhaps, they are able to minister to Zeezrom, right? Zeezrom is here. He's sick at Sidon. And when he hears that Alma and Amulek are there, first off, he's relieved because he assumed that they were dead, right? That they had been killed. Again, it's probably been a week, 10 days, who knows how long. And so he's been sick with a, a fever. But once he hears they're there, he wants them to come to him, right? And they go immediately and they find him sick on his bed. And he asks for healing, and Alma asks, do you believe in the power of Christ? This is a very New Testament type of question. When Christ does all of his healings, he always asks about faith, checks with the recipient first, and he says, yeah, I believe all the words that thou hast taught. Perfectly open heart, no hard heart here. And then confirming his belief, Alma prays to the Lord, and Zeezrom leaps on his feet and begins to walk, right? This is an immediate miraculous healing, and... Zezrom basically doesn't stop from there. It seems like he, he goes on his missionary journey and we'll catch back up with them later. But he is baptized and begins to preach. So he is actually fulfilling that pattern that Alma had mentioned, that he began to exercise faith and good works. And then he goes and teaches people commandments because he's been prepared and called and ordained. So just like Alma was, and Alma had a very similar experience, he was yeah. laid up in bed three days not being able to move. Who knows how long Zeeshram was laid up in bed. I just had a thought that if we're connecting these ba- baptisms back to some other places, you know, the the big example of baptism that we've seen so far in the Book of Mormon, which is Mosiah 18, that their, their baptism, they're committing to bear one another's burdens, mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and stand as a witness of God. And that's that's why he goes forth to preach the gospel. Fulfilling those commandments is is going to preach the gospel. And in verse 13, as Alma consecrated more priests and teachers in the land to baptize unto the Lord whosoever were desirous to be baptized. And it came to pass that they were many, for they did flock in from all the region round about Sidon and were baptized. So they have some good success here. These people's hearts are open. It's sort of a a snowball effect here of these baptisms um, leading more people to preach the gospel and baptize more. I think that this might confirm that the effect that Ammonihah had was that it seems like Ammonihah and Sidon are sort of rival cities, but Ammonihah being a little more conniving (laughs) with their infiltration of the judges and the chief judge and all of these sort of legal positions, perhaps they've exerted some authority on sort of the the hamlets around. And so after the chief judge and many of the leaders and lawyers killed, perhaps these people have a need to flee to, you know, a more organized place where they can gather. So the fall of Ammonihah has, again, resounding effects. We uh, wrap up chapter 15 by Alma taking Amulek with him back to his home in Zerhemla and took him to his own house, which is a beautiful echo of Amulek taking him in and his hospitality to Alma and Ammonihah. So Alma takes Amulek back to his house and did administer unto him in his tribulations and strengthen him in the Lord. So we learned that Amulek had been disowned, rejected by those who once were his friends and his father and his kindred. And we don't know if he was... (laughs) just exiled by his family, or if perhaps some of his family was that believed was killed in that great massacre by fire that happened in Ammonihah. But in any case, he is feeling very alone and in an incredible amount of grief. He just left everything he's ever known and all of his people. And so Alma takes him to his own home and cares for him. And thus ended the 10th year of the reign of the judges. So if we could go back to chapter 8, the very beginning of last week's reading, that one began us in verse 3, the commencement of the 10th year of the reign of the judges. And so the beginning of this year, Alma leaves Gideon to preach in Melech, and then after Melech heads to Ammonihah. And then by the end of this year, everything that has happened in Ammonihah, and they've returned, and Sidon, and they've returned to Zarahemla. So all of the 
Ammonihah saga fits within a year, which is pretty astounding to me, I think. I wonder about Mormon's composition here again, because he says uh, there having been much peace in the land of Zarahemla. It's like, okay, well, no wars nor contentions. Are you not including the Ammonihah massacre? No? Okay, well, this is just this is just the Lamanite incursions. So I'm not saying Mormon's doing a bad job, but every once in a while I wonder about some of his editorial decisions. Or perhaps he's drawing this from a legal account or like a, a war account that right. he's not drawing this from another. He's drawing this from a specific record that is right. focused on, you know, these sort of military ideas. The, the Department of Defense, not the Department of the Interior. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Lamanites come. Uh, they begin to attack. Uh, they get the city of Ammonihah. They destroy it thoroughly. Some around the borders of Noah and others taken captive into the wilderness. It's hard to tell if... It's saying they destroyed the people in Ammonihah and the borders of Noah, and then there's others that they took in the wilderness. Or if there's, is there three groups? Is there just two, you know, the, the people in the borders of Noah are not mentioned again, so it's kind of hard to tell. Are they brought with the other captives? Are they destroyed with the Ammonihah Heights? You have to ask the question, Noah, where is this? Who is naming a land after King Noah? Yeah, presumably this is King Noah. I mean, imagine there could be more than one person named Noah, but... Hard, hard to hard to tell. Uh, but the, the Nephites want to go after those people who've been captive in the wilderness, right? I think it's interesting that we get the chief captain over the army of the Nephites, right? So maybe this is his record. His name's Zoram, and he has two sons, Lehi and Aha. Or Aha. I, th- I think it's really touching that a guy who's named after Zoram named his son Lehi. And Zoram was essentially delivered by Nephi, Lehi's son, protected, and they, they got over to the promised land because of that promise. Because of that oath. And so, I don't know, there's something a little beautiful. You could think of Zoram as Lehi's adoptive son, although we don't, you know, that's not really the function. But he's brought into that same family, Mm -hmm. right? And here we have Zoram naming his son Lehi. So they they seek out Alma, having heard that he had the spirit of prophecy. And what is it they want to know from him? Where the Lord wants them to go so that they can get back their brethren who've been taken captive. They are not seeking out revenge. They're not saying, where can we go to hit the Lamanites hardest? Where can we go to seek to just slaughter them all? No, they just say like, how do we get them back? And because that's what they're seeking, Alma asks the Lord, Alma returned unto them and said, the Lamanites will cross the river Sidon in the south wilderness, away up beyond the borders of the land of Manti. And behold, there shall ye meet them on the east of the river Sidon. And there the Lord will deliver unto thee thy brethren who have been taken captive by the Lamanites. So it specifies that the Lord is going to be the one doing the delivering. Mm -hmm. Follow my directions and then the Lord will take care of the rest. And they do. They follow those instructions exactly. And that is what happens. They scatter the Lamanites And they took their brethren who had been taken captive by the Lamanites, and there was not one soul of them had been lost that were taken captive. And they were brought by their brethren to their own lands. And then it's done. Yeah. Real quick. Does it sound to you, like in verse 6, when it says Alma inquired of the Lord concerning this matter, does this kind of have Liahona, maybe, you know, Seerstone vibes to you? It definitely could. It, it just, it just the way that they come approach the prophet and ask him, well, what should we do? I mean, it reminds me of yeah. Nephi going to Lehi and saying, where should I go hunt for food? They recognize who has the authority, right? It seems like almost they have to seek him out, right? Yeah, and that he gets such specific instructions and directions. Yes. So, yeah. I could see him, you know, I'm not saying this is how it happened, but I could see him with a map and the Liahona and plotting it out mm-hmm. and seeing where it would be and getting this direction from the Lord. I mean, that that's, doesn't seem that far-fetched. And I think that this might make sense because presumably he's been going back through some of the records because of some of the things that he's going to say later, some of the things that he's learned. And so if he's been going back through the records, it's possible that he's also been going back through and finding the relics. That makes a lot of sense to me. So they, yeah, they follow those instructions exactly, and they don't go to seek revenge on the Lamanites. They just go to get their brethren back, and the Lord helps them to accomplish that, and then they all return home. Every living soul of the Ammonihah Heights was destroyed, and also their great city, which they said God could not destroy because of its greatness. But behold, in one day, it was left desolate. 
And I think that's also in the verses that follow as they really emphasize that. I think it goes along with what we were saying of the fruits of Nehorism, that what happens to the people of Ammonihah is a symbol of the fruits of Nehor's profession, that it does not bring forth any sort of prosperity or flowering, or it only brings death and desolation. Yeah, we have, following this, we have a stretch of peace between Lamanite incursions. Apparently three years is enough for continual peace, right? Alman and like to go and preach repentance. This is the only way to keep the Nephites in check is to constantly preach. Verse 15, we find the establishment of the church becomes more general, which is interesting. So this seems to be a more successful preaching. I can only hope that part of this is the fallout from the Ammonihah massacre, that people see. <laughs> Yet prior, they really hadn't had to deal with any of the consequences of sort of these alternate beliefs. I mean, Nehor was just a dude who was preaching, right? That's how he became popular. And yeah, he killed a guy, but okay, like he killed an old dude who, uh, whatever. But now when they talk about going to destroy the church of God, I think people are realizing, oh no, no, they actually want to destroy this church. Well, and just to be clear, that thing you said about Gideon would have been their attitude about Gideon, not yours. <laughs> you, Correct, are a huge, yeah. you are a huge Gideon fan. I just want to make that clear here. But I think also it's the fruit of Alma's preaching and teaching before going to Ammonihah in Zarahemla and Gideon and Melech and and then Sidon after it's so it's the the destruction of the bad and the building up of the good which is a very a very nice way to say in verse 17 that they might not be hardened against the word that they might not be unbelieving and go on to destruction but that they might receive the word with joy and as a branch be grafted into the true vine that they might enter into the rest of the Lord their God. So just clearing away the bad and then making room for the good is what made me think of that. Verse 18, you mentioned in our pre-show discussion, you know, all if you want to look for a list of peace-minded behaviors, or I guess these would be the not peace-minded behaviors, but if, you want, <laughs> right. if you're looking for a list of things to avoid. Yeah, yeah, these are all the interpersonal points of conflict, things that people do to each other that lead away from peace and justice. And so just making things fair and right and peaceful. Verse 19, holding forth things which must shortly come. So again, you know, Nehor had the whole issue with, I don't believe things that are going to happen in the future. I know, I know he didn't exactly say that. That's more of Sherem's belief, but Nehor clearly shares with that same heritage, but the coming of the son of God, his suffering and death, also the resurrection of the, day, the dead. So Christ, resurrection, repentance. Many people did inquire concerning the place where the Son of God should come, and they were taught that he would appear unto them after his resurrection, and this the people did hear with great joy and gladness. So this is where I this is where I would back up that Alma has done some studying, presumably of the small plates. He who knows how many records he had at this point, because he had all the records, large plates and small. We don't know how big that first part of the large plates were. Oh, and then other records that others had kept. He has all the records from <laughs> All the records from Zenith's people, mm -hmm. and he's got Alma, his father's records. So he, he's had a lot to deal with, and this is where, he well, now he preaches to them. Where in Alma 7, he has said that, you know, whether he's going to come to us, I don't know. Now he says, no, 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 he, he will appear to us after his resurrection. So he's learned or is now willing to share what he had known then. Well, that's all I have for this week. Yes, that uh, that ends the 14th year of the reign of the judges. And, I mean, what a wild 14 years <laughs> it has already been. Mostly peaceful, but punctuated with some incredibly violent <laughs> parts. Yeah. Just, it's hard not to think of the war chapters that are coming up. And thankfully, they are relatively far in the future. But I've definitely learned a lot more this time through these chapters in my study of the Book of Mormon. I think that this is, again doctrinally rich and potentially somewhat challenging in some of these parts, not just the, you know, dealing with the violence that, that is there, but also understanding what arguments Alma is formulating and how he is using them specifically for his calling. But hopefully our discussion has helped to clarify that or at least helped to befuddle it enough that you've got more questions that are good and can be answered. So that's all for this week. Thank you again to our editors for their hard work. Thank you for listening, and thank you for those who've left reviews. Make sure that uh, if you haven't reviewed yet, make sure to go review your this on your podcast platform of choice 
and subscribe so that you don't miss an episode and tell your friends about our discussions. If you'd like to get involved in the Latter-day Peace Studies Project, you can join the Facebook group Latter-day Nonviolence, Pacifism, and Peace Studies. We have links in the show notes. And you can check out the Get Involved page on our website, latterdaypeacestudies.org. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. So those of us who participate in the podcast, both hosting and editing, we volunteer our time. But there is some costs associated with running the website and being able to, to post the podcast. So if you could think about donating to help with those efforts, uh, we'd really appreciate it. For Latter-day Peace Studies, I'm Marianne. And I'm Dan. We'll see you next week.